Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the eighth Dialogues in Biological Anthropology. My name is Jeremy De Silva. I'm an assistant professor in the Anthropology Department here at BU. Um, and I'm incredibly pleased to introduce uh, an amazing panel of discussants. Um, this is, this is uh, like a, a, you know, for me, it's like a maybe a first year shortstop at my first all-star game, looking around at the future Hall of Famers. Um, to my far left is the director of the Institute of Human Evolution at Arizona State University. It's Dr. Bill Kimball. Uh, to my immediate left is the department chairperson at the uh, Department of uh, Anatomical Sciences at Stony Brook University, Bill Jungers. And to my right is Matt Cartmill, the department chair uh, of the anthropology department here at uh, BU. And we're discussing today an absolutely amazing uh, fossil discovery that was made in the 1990s and published in 2009 in the pretty extensive uh, issue of the Journal of Science. And that, of course, is the Artipithecus ramidus skeleton. Um, Artipithecus ramidus is one of many new incredible discoveries that have been made in the last couple of years. This is a wonderful time to be a paleoanthropologist. Um, and it's quite an amazing time to be a student of paleoanthropology as well, I, I, I hope, uh, for those of you who are here willingly or here because you got some bonus points on your final exam. I'm not sure yet. Um, but we're going to talk about this skeleton today because any new discovery, any amazing new discovery like Artie is, uh, comes with controversy uh, and comes with important discussion. And we're going to uh, hope to flesh out some of those issues today. Uh, but before we dive into that, I want to uh, provide a, a, a bit of perspective on this and, and how esteemed our, our panel is. Uh, in the mid-1970s, when the very famous Lucy was, uh, skeleton was discovered at Hadar by uh, Don Johansson, in the years that followed, some young scholars had an opportunity to uh, study that skeleton and study the material from Hadar and interpret what they were seeing in the craniodental and postcranial remains. Uh, and of course, craniodentally, Dr. Kimball and postcranially Dr. Jungers made incredibly important contributions to our understanding of what was at the time the oldest human relative uh, skeleton in Australopithecus afarensis lucy. And now we have a new potential uh, oldest human relative skeleton in Artipithecus ramidus three decades later. And so it's really something special to have uh, these folks here talking about this, this skeleton. So the way I want to start off is just have uh, Drs. Kimball and Jungers uh, explain uh, a little bit about their position here, uh, where they're coming from in terms of their own interpretations of Artie, perhaps where they started and, and now where they've uh, maybe not ended, but where they are currently in understanding Artie. Uh, and, and then uh, for a different view, viewpoint on the interpretation of the skeleton, an important viewpoint, um, uh, Professor Cartmill is going to speak mom uh, for, for a few moments. And then we're uh, going to answer some questions that all of us have up here amongst ourselves. Um, and then we're going to open it up to questions from you guys. And hopefully, you have plenty of them. So I'll start with uh, Dr. Kimball. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My starting position is, uh, is as follows. If you take a human skull and you compare it to that of an ape and turn it upside down, look at the base, which you might think of as the invisible anatomy part that you can't see when you look at a whole skeleton unless you search. There are an enormous number of differences that relate, some to posture, some to the shape and size of the brain. Most obviously, the, the position of the frame and magnum, the great opening on the base of the skull through which the spinal cord passes and flanked on either side by the occipital condyles where the vertebral column articulates with the head, is very far forward and central on the base of the skull in humans compared to almost any other primate. And in the process phylogenetically of the frame and magnum moving forward on the base in humans, the neurovascular channels, which are manifest on the base as foramina openings, spread out so that in humans, the central part of the base is not only very short with the frame and magnum very far forward, it's indeed in the center of it very wide in relation to the overall size of the skull. We see already these changes <clears throat> and other associated anatomical modifications that are associated with them in the temporal bone and the occipital bone. We see them already in the earliest Australopithecus skulls at three and a half million years ago or so. So the question is, is that given that those changes tie Australopithecus and all hominins subsequent to us, does Artipithecus have those same modifications that are associated with its relatively abbreviated cranial base 
and forward frame and magnum, as was first described in the journal Nature in 1994 when Artipithecus was diagnosed as a, as a relative of, of ours. And the work that I've begun with my uh, colleagues, Gen Sua, Tim White, Yola Rak, and, and Burhani Asfau, shows that, in fact, Artipithecus does indeed have many of those additional modifications, including a very wide central base and other morphological accommodations to the shifting around of these landmarks as the frame and magnum moves forward, structures move out to the side, the neurovascular structures move out to the side. Um, it would appear that these changes are part and parcel of an adaptation to becoming upright. And as Bill will speak more directly to, they seem to tie what's going on to the base of the skull, in the base of the skull, to what's going on elsewhere in the body, and makes Artipithecus, despite all its oddities, and there are plenty of them, yeah. Uh, makes it a relative of yours and mine, and uh, less so to that of a chimpanzee or a gorilla. Thanks, Bill. Uh, and now for a postcranial perspective, turn to Bill Jungers. Yeah. Um, well, my position has been a little bit of a moving target. Uh, when it already first appeared, I was uh, certainly agnostic, and I think I was overwhelmed by the foot, the arboreal grasping signal in the foot, and sort of uh, missed some other more subtle, but I think uh, diagnostic features. Uh, I think there aren't many features that are diagnostic uh, of bipedality in Artie, but I think there's some very good ones. And that includes uh, the lateral digits, uh, the joint between the metatarsals and, and the phalanges. Uh, again, I was also rather skeptical about the pelvis when it was first published, in the sense that I couldn't see how anyone could make sense out of uh, that puzzle. Uh, but having a chance to see it, it became clear that there really was a, a part of that pelvis uh, that appeared to speak to bipedalism. That is the very short iliac height. Uh, and so suddenly you had a, a, a pelvis that uh, had features uh, of the false pelvis that looked hominin-like, connected to a true pelvis that was decidedly primitive and ape-like. Uh, some of the other features that have been reconstructed, uh, I, I think it, for now I have to take on face value. And I think many of us may have to make a, our own judgment calls about it, because I don't think it's likely to happen in the near future that people are going to have the opportunity to methodically take every little piece apart uh, and put it back together. Uh, but if the reconstruction is correct, there are some interesting things about iliac blade orientation that also is, is compatible. Uh, with bipedalism. And then I was very pleasantly surprised by the, the recent paper by uh, Rousseau and Kirk that seemed to link um, the position of the frame in magnum not just to orthograde uh, uh, posture, uh, but in hominoids in particular, specifically to bipedality. And that seemed to be uh, characteristic of bipeds and other kinds of mammals. And I thought that was fascinating. Um, and so I saw these features, not numerous, but uh, sufficient to diagnose bipedality, and they could be added to the, the character list of features that are synapomorphies between Artie uh, and other hominins. Uh, and finally, just I mentioned the hand. Uh, it's a, it is a powerful grasping organ, but it has a quite, a, quite a reduced thumb. The phalangeal curvature is really extraordinary, uh, and I think that there are other signals in that hand that indicate that it is not the hand of a quadruped. And it's certainly not a quadruped that in the kind of categories we normally define. It's not a knuckle walking hand. It's not a digitigrade hand. And contrary to what I thought I read in the science papers, uh, I don't think it's the hand of a palmigrade quadruped either. Uh, and you know, I, I think Matt made some good points. The hand is long relative to the foot. The phalanges are very curved. This is, a, this is a hand that's capable of a lot of things, but I don't believe it's the hand of a quadruped. Uh, thank you. Um, so many students, I think, that are first learning about human evolution, first learning about Artipithecus and its place in human evolution, um, don't necessarily see the, the game-changing 
uh, ideas that were presented in the paper, because as you go back in time through Janus Homo into Australopithecus into Artipithecus, of course you're gonna get something that is not as good at bipedalism and maybe just shows these subtle changes to bipedalism, like the frame and magnum and the lateral metatarsals and things like that, and you're not gonna have as large of a brain size, so what is the big deal? Uh, wouldn't we have expected to find something like this? And the important thing to recognize is that the interpretation of the skeleton is that the body plan of this thing is generalized in a fashion that all of the modern apes would have had to have independently evolved their suspensory orthograde body postures and locomotion. And so I, I will turn to Matt Cartmill uh, to talk about some potential problems associated with that interpretation of this generalized body plan. Well, thanks, Jeremy. I, I, I'm going to talk about this very briefly because I am mindful of the cautionary principle that Bill Jungers put up on his last slide, which is, if you haven't seen the fossils, shut up. And I haven't Not quite that. Well, <laughs> you put your it, it's, it, I'll put it more kindly. Before speaking, it is always best to have seen the fossils. Um, and I haven't. And, but I have been reasonably careful about this. I haven't shot off my mouth ignorantly in print. I've only shot it off ignorantly at public uh, conversations and talks like, <laughs> like this one. So I'm going to do it again. Uh, but uh, I'm hoping to see the fossils before I actually have to write something about it in the next edition of my textbook with, with uh, Fred Smith. But at, but at any rate, um, I haven't come all the way into the fold the way that Bill Jungers has. Uh, from, from being the strayed lamb. Um, but I've come all the way up to the gate, and I'm just sort of standing outside bleeding resentfully. Um, and so let me do a little of that bleeding for you guys now. Uh, when I saw the Artie uh, papers in, in that special issue of science in 2009, I was, I was indignant. I looked at the cover photograph. Let me rehearse the claims that are being made here. The claims are, one, this is a hominin. That is, it's more closely related to human beings than it is to our nearest living relatives, the chimpanzees. Uh, secondly, it's an ancestor of modern humans. Uh, it's uh, specifically it evolved into the first species of the genus Australopithecus, Australopithecus afarensis. And thirdly, it shows uh, no signs of having ever passed through an ape-like uh, pattern of locomotion or adaptations to an ape-like suspensory, upright, orthograde, arm-swinging kind of locomotor adaptation. Uh, in fact, the last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees, according to that paper, uh, according to the papers in that issue of Science, was an above-branch quadruped, uh, an animal that walked around on top of branches like a monkey. Okay, I had problems with all of these things. I thought, I looked at the cover photograph of the skeleton, and I said, wait a minute, this thing, it says here this thing has four limbs that are the same length as its hind limbs. But it hasn't got a humerus, and it's only got a little chunk of femur. And so the length of the, of the upper arm and the length of the, of the thigh are being estimated from the length of the radius in the forearm and the shin bone or tibia down in, your, in the calf. And, and if you look at the photograph on the cover, it's obvious that the tibia is shorter than the radius. So how do you come up with, with uh, the same length for the fore and hind limb? Something is wrong here. Um, and I didn't believe a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so I, I did, however, uh, go and look at the casts. Uh, these are good, high-quality casts that, that Owen Lovejoy was kind enough to let me come and look at uh, uh, at uh, Kent State University in Ohio. And like I say, I didn't come all the way into the fold, but I came to appreciate that a lot of the things he was saying were true. Um, the fore and hind limb elements that are preserved really are about the same length. I don't know what happened to the photograph of the tibia on the cover of Science, but the tibia really is about the same length as the radius. Uh, I, with the worst and most evil intentions in the world, I could not make that tibia significantly shorter <laughs> than, than, than the radius, no matter how I fiddled the pieces and so on. OK, couldn't do it. So I'm willing to accept, I think, a lot of what a lot of the same conclusions that, that Bill Jungers was driven to, perhaps even less reluctantly than I was. Uh, I think probably this is an animal that is probably on the human, not the chimpanzee branch of the, of the African ape tree. 
and that is it's a phylatic hominin. I think it probably was spending a certain amount of time walking around on its hind limb. There are adaptations in the hind limb, like the, the doming of the, the metatarsal heads that Bill Jungers talked about, that really are pretty distinctive of and diagnostic of um, uh, the kind of terrestrial bipedality that we see in human beings, uh, right, as walking around flapping your forelimbs in the air and pushing off with your hind feet. Uh, so I'll buy into it that far. What I don't buy into, I still don't buy into, is the proposition that the last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees was an above branch monkey like quadrupedal animal. And those of you who saw the webcast uh, uh, at least saw my, my um, uh, typographical display of petulance uh, in, in which I put up about 50 uh, supposed, well, not just supposed, real synapomorphies, non primitive features that all the living apes and humans share in common with each other, and most of which, in fact, all of which are reasonably interpreted as having originated as adaptations to arm swinging suspensory kinds of locomotions, brachiation broadly defined, including the sorts of things that orangutans do. Um, now, that said, I think Bill Jungers is right to say that some of these things we know predated uh, an ape-like postcranial morphology. For example, tail loss, okay? Uh, the loss of the tail, I think, has something to do with the, with the reduction of galloping and, and, and rapid quadrupedal above-branch kinds of gaits in the ancestral hominoids, uh, but that doesn't necessarily imply vertical posture. Maybe that loss of the tail was pre-adaptive for vertical posture because it freed up the tail muscles to become the pelvic diaphragm that helps to support your, your pelvic entrails and keep them from falling out between your legs uh, in, a, in a vertical posture. And maybe it does that job and evolved that job independently in orangutans and gibbons and, and uh, chimpanzees and humans and so on. Fair enough. But there's a lot of other stuff that about the human and ape postcranial morphology that doesn't really make sense as having originated in any other context other than a whole lot of, of use of the forelimb to lift and move and propel the body, um, more so than you would see in any kind of quadruped. Uh, just a couple of morphological examples. Uh, in human beings, the latissimus dorsi, that's that big muscle, the, the lats, for those of you who work out, which I don't, the, uh, that's that big muscle that forms the back wall of your armpit. You stick your fingers into your armpit, the latissimus dorsi has the massive meat in back of your fingers. It pulls the, it pulls the, the, the humerus downwards and backwards. Obviously an important propulsive movement. Uh, okay, and it's an important propulsive muscle in a quadruped too. But in quadrupeds, it attaches only to the vertebral column. In human beings and apes, it goes down and attaches to the pelvis so that it lifts the pelvis by by downward movement of the, of the upper limb. Uh, this is not useful in, and it's never found in, quadrupeds. Uh, pectoralis minor, a little muscle that comes off the rib cage in front and goes up to the upper arm in, in most mammals. In humans and apes, it only goes to the, to the shoulder blade. Okay, so it doesn't affect the, the independent movement of the upper limb on the shoulder blade. It just helps to support the entire body through the scapula, through the shoulder blade. Um, and so on. There are, you know, 40 or 50 little details of, of human and ape anatomy like this that, to my mind, are giving us a signal of suspension, of orthograde. And I see that even in the, in the Artipithecus skeleton, as Bill, Mel, as Bill Jungers mentioned. Um, this is one of the striking things about the, the Artipithecus hand and foot is that the hand is a lot bigger than the foot. And the, the data shown and given in the science paper in 2009, if you look at them uh, carefully, uh, you'll see that, that in this respect, Artipithecus sorts with brachiators. It doesn't sort with quadrupeds. It doesn't sort with bipeds. Uh, it sorts with the African apes. It's got a big hand uh, and with big, uh, phalan big, highly curved phalanges and a rather dinky little thumb. Okay, and this tells me that this is an uh, an organ that is being used to a considerable extent as a hook-like structure for pulling upwards, as opposed to the foot, which has this big, robust um, uh, first metatarsal sticking out that tells me that this is a, this is a grasping organ, not used as a hook at all. Uh, in the trees, it's presumably grasping the, the thing that the animal is standing on. 
So I see signs in the Artipithecus skeleton itself of, of um, the kind, some adaptations, at least in an early and incipient Miocene ape kind of way, to the to the 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 sort of orthograde and suspensory locomotion that. Um, Owen Lovejoy and, and, and Tim White and their co-workers would like to read out of the human lineage altogether. I remain skeptical about that, and I still need to be convinced. But, uh, you know, maybe I'll make my way into the fold eventually. I, I would say that, <clears throat> that uh, a little bit like poison, it's sort of, you know, pick your homoplasy. Uh, I think that there, there are features of the pelvic and, and proximal femoral anatomy of other hominines, like auroran, uh, that do, and even if you throw auroran out and just com, you know, compare some of the Miocene apes, uh, earlier Miocene apes to, to later hominines, uh, it's pretty clear that the phonetic resemblance, at least, the shape similarities are much greater between those proximal femora and hominines uh, than they are with any of the great apes. So in that, in that final plot that I, I sort of threw up from, from a recent paper, it, it looks to me like, at least in some aspects of, of, of their anatomy, uh, they are uh, homoplastic, that they are features that have evolved convergently. Uh, but I'm also you know, sympathetic to the notion that some aspects of the bowel plan, uh, are hard to explain from an ancestral quadrupedal position. Uh, but I, I do think that there is, uh, rampant homoplasy in any way you want to connect the dots. Yeah, and I, I, I would just amplify that point, and I, I don't, I think Matt gets it, but not everybody else necessarily does, uh, because it's a relatively subtle point that the, the rampant homoplasy is not dependent on Artipithecus being more closely related to us than to a chimpanzee, for example. Because if Artipithecus is, in fact, granting the argument primitive for the large-bodied hominoids, you have the same problem with homoplasy no matter where it's rooted within the hominoids, whether it's a relative of chimps or humans or gorillas or what have you. It's the same problem. So these are very different questions and draw on different data um, for each. Yeah, I, I agree. Let me, let me put that a little uh, slightly differently, which may be easier for some people to understand. If Suppose Artipithecus was a primitive gorilla and showed signs of having a quadrupedal ancestry. It would be the same quadrupedal ancestry that it would have to be if it was a primitive chimpanzee or a primitive human. That is the last common ancestor of the African uh, hominoids. So no matter where you stick it on the branching diagram, as long as it's giving a, a genuine quadrupedal signal, it poses the same problem. Correct. Should we open it up for questions? Hopefully. You have questions? All right, if you do, raise your hand, and a microphone will come around to you. If you have answers, also raise your hand. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, we'll take a few of those. Can we ask questions of other experts in the audience? Yeah, I don't see why not. We do have experts in the audience. There are, there are certainly you know, a couple of people in the audience who know a great deal about pelvic anatomy, uh, who know a great people in the audience who know a lot. I'd be curious to, to see what some of those people might think about the already pithecus pelvis. Are we asking this question? I am. All right. <laughs> I don't know. It, maybe maybe everybody will answer. <laughs> uh, it, so if folks don't have, uh, do you guys want to want to speak to this? Have you do you have thoughts on on the pelvis? Sorry to put you on the spot. Either of you actually. We have here uh, Dr. Warner and Dr. Luton. Um, um. I am interested to um, hear your discussion and interpretation of the pelvis. I, like you, was skeptical when I first saw um, the, you know, the pieces that it began as and then the final hole in terms of the reconstruction. Um, and I find myself wavering back and forth whether or not how convinced I am. I agree with you that the shortening of the um, iliac blade is probably something real that we can see. I'm less convinced about the, the rotation and I'm, um, I, I'm less familiar with the, the um, attributes of the lower part of the pelvis. If you could, if you could speak to those for a minute in terms of like hamstring attachment or so forth, in terms of what um, what you see there, I would be fascinated to to get your perspe perspective on those issues as well. Thank you. 
<laughs> Please. I also haven't seen the fossil. So I am reserving judgment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like everybody else, it does. I do agree that it does seem to have a short ilium, not just the ilium, but also the lower ilium, which is biomechanically important. Yeah. Um, it is not clear to me what exactly is going on with iliac flare. I think that's really hard to see from the casts, and um, I haven't I haven't seen the originals. I also haven't seen the models. Um, it seems like the ilia do seem to be a little bit more laterally positioned, which is also important for bipedality. How much of that is, is actually there, I, I really have no idea. Um, a lot has been made about the long ischium and what that has to do with um, function of the hamstrings. I'm not so sure that that, that is quite important. Um, it is true that bipeds have a short ischium, um, I don't know how detrimental it would be to have a long one. I really think the most important feature of the pelvis is the ilium, and I wish that I could see it. Yeah. <laughs> just, just ask, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you can. Yeah. Could, could, I, could, I, could I speak to the, the question of the, of the ischium? Um, it is true that Artipithecus does have a long ischium, and it hasn't been shortened and repositioned as it is in Lucy and, and other hominins. Uh, but you know, that is a, a great anatomy for a climbing animal. And we know the hams, we know from electromyographical uh, evidence in, in climbing uh, primates that they are, they are propulsive organs along with the quadriceps and, and, and moving up branches. Yes, and the dreaded vertical climbing that apparently Artie was not allowed to do, uh, I'm sure it was capable of climbing vertically and, and, and obliquely. Uh, and the hamstrings would certainly assist in that. So I can, I can sort of understand how you might have a stepwise process in pelvic modification with the lateral balance and, and, and center of gravity issues sort of coming first. And I agree with you that uh, for the kind of biped that already was, a long ischium probably was not any disadvantage. But Bill, could I ask you a question about the, the orientation of the iliac blades? Uh, the Arty reconstruction uh, uh, put out by Tim and Owen and their co-workers uh, has, the, has the iliac blades rotated around so that this, this upper blade of the pelvis faces more laterally than it does in other early hominins, in, in, in the later ones, in Australopithecus, you know, where it faces more or less backwards as it does in apes. And looking at that reconstruction, I can't help but feel that the position of those blades is to a very large extent dependent on the size and shape of the sacrum. And there isn't a sacrum. And if you put a narrow, narrower sacrum in there, a more ape-like sacrum, I think you would wind up uh, with uh, uh, much less laterally rotated uh, iliac blades. And it would look more like what you'd expect to see in, a, uh, in an ape pelvis. What do you think of that? You've seen the specimens. Well, I think that the, they argued that uh, the space between the iliac blades was constrained a little bit by uh, the lengths and orientation of the pubic ramus and the ischiopubic ramus below, uh, that somehow, uh, uh, and that would obviously, that wouldn't affect only the iliac blades, it would affect the shape of the pelvic outlet. I don't know what obstetrical implications that might have, but I think that's the, the reasoning behind it is that they had to accommodate the orientation and bring the pubic symphyses together. But, the, but in the reconstruction, the, the pubes are not in contact with each other, so the symphysis... Well, there's a symphysis of some kind. Yeah, there's a, but the symphysial region is imaginary also. Mm. In, in, not, not, I mean, not the part that's there, but the part that actually contacted isn't, isn't present in the fossils. Well, you mean the, the soft tissue? The, well, the soft tissue, or the... Or the, the epi, Owen would say it's the epiphyses in between right. the, right. the, the issue of pubic... Uh, bodies. Yeah, I, I, again, I can't, you know, I, I wasn't there for the, but I think that's the reason. That's all I'm saying. I think is they were, that they were trying, they, they felt that that was the, 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 the most logical orientation. But I think as, you know, we talked about earlier, uh, by your estimation, at least based on that picture, uh, the sacrum of Artie was even wider. Mm -hmm. uh, than yeah. Lucy, which is remarkably wide to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let, let me ask a question, if I might, about the, the uh, intermembral index. Okay, okay the, the story is that Artie has uh, 
basically the, the forelimb is the same length as the hind limb. And this is being taken as a signal of uh, a, a persistently primitive trait, a signal of a quadrupedal ancestry. Why isn't it a signal of incipient bipedality and the increase, an increase in the size of the hind limb or a decrease in the size of the forelimb? In other words, why is this a primitive trait rather than a derived Australopithecus-like feature? Well, they, they argue that, and then it's very hard to do this for earlier Miocene apes, but uh, they argue that, uh, that you know, they have proconsul, uh, and so they feel that the proportions they see in Artie are, are more like that than they are of any, any great ape. Uh, I, I think that's... Yeah, they are, uh, they are, they are know, rather it, like... It is also the case, and I, that, that what I find fascinating is that certainly the humerofemoral index uh, of Artie is pretty much spot on Australopithecus afarensis, i.e. Lucy, uh, which seems to be a perfectly fine index for a biped. So again, I'm not so sure that that is a signal of prone-to-grade quadrupedalism. And I think we're actually, you might even be agreeing on this, Matt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Thanks. My question actually follows on this point. So Matt expressed some uh, skepticism about there being sort of legitimate uh, signals of prone-to-grade quadrupedalism in the, in the post -crania. So, And you sort of had suggested that there, there really were some that were diagnostic of uh, prone-to-grade quadrupedalism. And I don't think there are any. Oh, uh, OK. So then, so is no one convinced that it was a, a prone-to-grade quadruped? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I'd go that far. That's a, that's a tricky question. You touch on a sore point. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think as most people read the document, and it's, you know, that's just so chock full of information, it takes a while to get through it. My interpretation, and I, I think Jeremy and I were talking this morning, he also came away with the same inference, and a lot of people I know thought that they were arguing that already when the trees was a pronograde, quadrupedal, palmograde animal. Um, and I didn't see any evidence of that uh, in, in the hands in particular. Uh, but I've, in some interesting exchanges with, uh, with Dr. White, uh, he claims that that was never said about Artipithecus, that it referred only to the inferred uh, locomotor adaptations as the ancestral, the, pre the ancestors that preceded Artipithecus. So a lot of us have uh, misunderstood, I think, uh, what they were saying about the locomotor repertoire of Artie uh, in the trees. So um, I, I want to take a step back, I guess, and, and simplify this a little bit, at least in my mind. Um, could you guys take us into a, a, a brief sort of day in the life of an Artie? Is it, how often is it up in the trees? How often is it down on the ground and bipedal? Can we know that? When it is bipedal, is it, is this arboreal hand assisted bipedalism or is it on the ground? And if it's on the ground bipedal, why? Why, because bipedalism is slow and it, why would it, why would it do that? Um, what is the environment like? What was it eating? I know there's a host of questions, but, but reconstructing a, a, this animal and fleshing it out a little bit, I think, would help us, if you can. <laughs> this is this is a tricky one. Um, obviously, I don't I don't think we can get to percentages of time spent in the trees versus the ground using these fossils. They they don't come with that kind of information attached. But it is an animal that spans that that is that is critical in the human evolutionary story because it is the first one that spans the gap between an, an animal that was selected partly for living in the trees and selected partly for living on the ground. In my view, and now you know, Bill and I will speciate at this point, <laughs> but in my view, the anatomy of, of Lucy, Afarensis, shows where that selection was trending. It was trending away from the adaptive value of life in the trees towards adaptive value on the ground. So, if we put Lucy on one side, and most other, in fact, virtually all of the primates, except the really large ones on the other, you can see that this is a creature that, that spends significant amounts of time in the trees. And that's what its foot tells us, and its lower pelvis, and 
potentially and tied to the foot tells us. So a day in the life, feeding, sleeping in the trees, on the moving from, from patch to patch on the ground, perhaps. Um, and you know, that's 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 the link, basically. I'm not hearing foraging on the ground and bringing back yeah, food I, to yeah, the females. Again, are we talking, I know, are we talking well, me, about the males or the females? No, 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 let me, let, but let, but let, 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 me, let me jump in here and, and, and say that, you know, I, I'm happy to tell you what I think. I'm less happy to interpret what my colleagues think who aren't here. So, so you know, I, I long ago gave up reading those kinds of tea leaves. So, so you know, that's what I think. Well, all right, fair enough, but I mean, it's not as though it's not as though Professor Lovejoy has not, in fact, expressed an opinion on no, this. No, but but Professor Lovejoy can speak for himself. He doesn't need me to do it for him. That's fair enough, of course. Well, I don't mind being wrong. So, <laughs> so I, I I think that uh, that Artie came to the ground and walked by Peterly because she could, and, and by that I mean I think. I'm moving towards a position that uh, bipedality may have co-evolved on the ground and in the trees. That I'm not talking about a, the orangutan model that, that, that Thorpe and, and Crompton have promoted, uh, but something similar, more similar to what Sanu and Pickford have said. That you know, truncal erectness, even some sus suspension, maybe assisted bipedality. You know, I think I think already since I don't find a pronograde signal in, in the hand, I'm thinking more and more that a lot of time was spent uh, bipedality in, in bipedal postures and orthograde postures in the trees. Good. So it came to the ground, presumably to forage. I don't know if it came to the ground to provision, uh, you know, males provision. I don't, I don't know about, but I'm, I am partial to, to models for origins of bipedalism that involve carrying. I think those, you know, mm -hmm. again, we're, we're now creating, you know, scenarios. Um, but I, you know, I prefer that model to standing over, you know, looking over high grasses oh, well, or, 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 you know, <laughs> permanent estrus displays and crazy <laughs> stuff. Like that. So, you know, again, I, I think that uh, the, I think the bipedal signal uh, may, may be stronger than I thought. Bill has, has the mixture of, of arboreal and terrestrial adaptations in Artipithecus caused you to revise your thinking about the importance of arboreal behavior in early Australopithecus? Well, it's interesting uh, that after uh, a, a paper appeared that Jeremy was a co-author on about climbing in modern humans, um, Owen went on record to say that he always thought australopithecines could climb, uh, just that it was not sort of the uh, evolutions, the direction of evolution's arrow, adaptive arrow. And I, I, I can agree with that. I think there's no doubt that all afarensis was a more efficient, uh, more capable uh, biped. I mean, if, if, we're, if they're right about Artie, uh, Artie doesn't have the sort of not need morpholo not need morphology that we see in, in, in australopithecines. Uh, it's kind of bipedality would be ungainly by comparison uh, to what I think occurred in, in afarensis. Uh, but I still think that the you know those elements that contact the substrate, like the hands and feet, you know they still manifest features uh, in, in australopithecus that I think are not by chance being retained for a long time. I think they are enabling and reflecting uh, an ability to get in and out of trees in, in, a, in a way that modern humans, which ain't bad, uh, they could do much better than them. So again, I think my position you know, has, I'd like to think, shifted subtly. Uh, but I still think that australopithecines, uh, and some species more than others, uh, probably still were involved in a good deal of arboreal activities, despite the fact that they were better bipeds than Artie. I, I would just say that the argument about Lucy's locomotion, I don't want to get too far off on a tangent here, was never about whether Lucy could climb a tree no. better than we could or, or what have you. It was about whether her, her, ana, her anatomy, her locomotor anatomy, reflects selection for current utility in the trees or whether it is their primitive retentions right. and, and so forth. So no one ever said Lucy couldn't climb a tree. And there's no doubt she could climb a tree better than most of us in this room. 
but that hasn't been the, the critical question. Uh, so we have questions out there. Um, Alex? Hi. Um, my question concerns the cranial base. Um, and first finally. off, finally. <laughs> yeah, finally, sorry. Um, first off, I, I, and I don't really know, but are there, uh, what is the cranial base record in the Miocene? Um, mm. uh, in, the later, in the earlier Miocene, um, are there any? And I think it's a pertinent question, um, especially for those very, apparently very orthograde dispensary uh, European Miocene names. What would cause the cranial base to be reorganized for bipedalism as opposed to what seems to be very obligate orthograde suspensory activities with no ter with no ter with no real terrestrial quadrupedalism right um, there there are very 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 few clues from the miocene as to cranial base anatomy there are bits and pieces there is the oreopithecus cranial base which for my money is is essentially useless and is not reconstructable um, My take on the cranial base reorganization has less to do with the posture of the trunk below the neck than what's going on at the level of the neck for the following reason. If you look at gibbons, for example, gibbons are as orthograde as humans are, yet their neck posture is not that of a human. Their heads are slung forward on the cervical vertebral column. and the, the few data that are available on neck posture show they basically have the same neck angle as a chimpanzee. And their cranial base reflects that. They're orthograde, but they do not have any of the human modifications in their cranial base. So one of the gaps in the fossil record, are, it's a huge gap in our understanding, in, in Australopithecus even, is what does the cervical vertebral column look like? And we were talking about this earlier because we don't really have any idea. We don't know whether a lumbar lordosis, which they do have, implies a cervical lordosis, we just assume it has, it does, because this is the way humans are organized, but the fact is we don't know. And there are a few cervical vertebrae from the Hadar collection of Australopithecus afarensis, and they show an interesting mix of human-like and ape-like characteristics, and so do the occipital condyles, by the way, in spite of their relatively forward position. Uh, they have a very strong, strongly angulated articular surface, which is reflected in the in the, in the mirror image of the C1 that we have and the, and the lower cervical, though not like an exaggerated, not, not as exaggerated as in chimpanzees, the spine is, is long and straight rather than short and, and, and inferiorly angulated. So I would love to be able to see more about uh, the cervical vertebral column of Australopithecus and maybe with some of the new material coming out of South Africa, we'll have a better idea. But at least in terms of afarensis, we don't. And I suspect there's some information there on the cranial base. Speaking of, of South Africa, how does Mrs. Plez fit in here? As, as a lot of people have pointed out, STS-5 has a rather ape-like, long uh, uh, cranial base. The, uh, the, the axes of the, of the petrosal axes are, are oriented more anteroposteriorly and less transversely uh, than they are in, say, robust Australopithecus, which is very human-like. Uh, What's, what's going on with Mrs. Plez? How come she looks so ape-like? Well, I would, con I would contest the description, first of all. I don't think that, that the cranial base of A. Africanus, uh, Mrs. Plez, is all that ape-like. Mm -hmm. The entire brain case of A. Africanus in relation to most overall measures of cranial size is narrow. And that is reflected in some of the dimensions, relative dimensions, in the central part of the cranial base. But the, the length of the base, no matter where you judge it, is short. And the, the relative to a chimpanzee, those landmarks in the middle of the base are spread out. And so, yes, it is a little less derived than the robust Australopithecines, which is, as you said, are a little more human-like in this respect. But it is by no means easily mistaken for an ape. Uh, uh, whether you look at the angulation of the petrus or in the relative dimensions of the landmarks under there. So I think it's, it, it's an exaggerated, uh, it stems back to work that Chris Dean and Bernard Wood did in the 1980s out of Chris Dean's dissertation. And uh, they usefully pointed out the distinction, but it doesn't make them like a chimpanzee. But one of the things I'm really struggling with, and this is for both of you actually, that 
Um, <clears throat> if these papers are right, chimpanzees are highly derived. And yet, when we compare these fossils to any, you know, to the, to the obvious things to compare them to, all we can do is compare to a modern chimp. And yet, if it's a derived animal, aren't we sort of chasing our tail here and saying, well, it doesn't look like a chimp. Chasing the absence not a of chimp. our tail. And, yeah, so how much, right, the absence of the yeah, African ape fossil time. record, how much of that is just really clouding our ability to know polarity of characters it's, and to know any of this stuff? It's, it is, and what it's forcing us to do that is to ask questions that may not be meaningful uh, in terms of the answers we'd like. Um, if we had a fossil record of chimp and gorilla evolution, we would be in a different position here today with regard to understanding Artipithecus. But the fact is we don't. So, you know, I like to, I like to say that, that in some sense, we are like Charles Darwin in, in, in that in, in, in where we have a gap in the fossil record, we're forced to triangulate back to common ancestors from terminals terminal taxa, and whether we're, you're talking about humans or chimpanzees or whether you're talking about Australopithecus and Paranthropus, you know, at a given time slice, they are terminal. Mm -hmm. And so we are, we are always, without a relatively complete fossil record, we're always forced to do the thing that Darwin did to great effect in the 19th century, which was to take chimps and humans and subtract the unique features of each and see, try to explain the common ancestry or in the case of humans, to project ahead how you would account for the catalog of differences. Mm -hmm. But of course, without a, without a calendar of events, which is what the fossil record supplies, we have no test, mm -hmm. you know, except simply moving further down the, 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 the cladogram. But it still doesn't help you understand the acquisition of human, the unique human characteristics. So how would you identify a chimpanzee fossil? in that case, a five million year old chimp. How would you know that's what you had? Well, in the skull, I would, I would, look, I would look for relatively enlarged incisors, certainly, because they are the largest incisors. They and orangs have the largest incisors of any hominoid, extant hominoid. I would look for the exaggerated lower facial prognathism that chimps have that, 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 that bonobos don't, for example. Okay. Um, you know, so forth and so on. Those are the sorts of things that I would that I would expect to see, if I were going to be certain I was dealing with an ancestral chimp as opposed to something that was close to you know at the common ancestry of gorillas and chimps, or was more closely related to gorillas, for example. But you know, I mean, this is just you know, hand waving because you know we don't have the record and and we won't have it in our lifetimes. I would I would hope to help diagnose it. To, if I had a hand, I think if knuckle walking was a primitive condition, the last common ancestor, I think you could probably diagnose that. Uh, and because I, I think that that's a derived morphology. I, I used to think that it w was impossible uh, to, that chimps and gorillas had evolved knuckle walking independently. Uh, but I think there have arguments have been made that, that pers persuade me to at least consider that possibility as very viable. Uh, when I talk about the, the team that uh, of, of really insightful young investigators that I work with, I mean, we don't all agree uh, completely. I think that uh, Kaylee Orr uh, believes that the wrist, for example, of Artie is a very, <coughs> is very stiff. In fact, early hominins are very stiff. Uh, and he thinks that, you know, you can't rule out knuckle walking ancestry. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm dodging your your question, um, what would be diagnostic would be things that we already know occur in a chimpanzee. There might be entrapment of you know, the sacrum in, in an elongated ilium. Yeah, but um, but you'd, you'd need to exclude the gorilla, though, too. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I can pick your homoplasy. Yeah. OK, uh, Eve? Hi, so you've all sort of addressed the complexity of the phylogenetic picture before Artipithecus. I'm sure a lot of us are interested in the picture that results after. after. So um, I was wondering how you all reconcile the idea that Artipithecus leads into afarensis mm. with the, with, um, when you consider the two potentially very different pedal morphologies, the two different feet around like three million years ago. The Bertelli foot is what you're referring to. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't do phylogenetics. <laughs> <laughs> 
chicken. <laughs> um, let, well, let, let me start out by saying that in the, in the science papers of 2009, um, the lead paper by Tim White and colleagues presented as one hypothesis of three mm -hmm. that Artipithecus was a lineal ancestor of Australopithecus. Um, I don't know, frankly, how, how committed he is to any one to the exclusion of the others. But it, Artipithecus was entertained there also as an early, as a, as a late representative of a population that split off closer to the chimp human divergence and then evolved in parallel once that happened, or not in parallel, but evolved alongside, if you will, uh, the lineage that gave rise to Australopithecus. So we, we don't know. Um, we do know that the earliest Australopithecus at 4.2 million Australopithecus anamensis, if, if, this is a big if, if the proximal tibia from Canopoi is associated with the craniodental material attributed to anamensis, then anamensis, like afarensis, was a, was a terrestrial biped. Then the Bertali foot would be a, a second lineage. It is also possible, because it's been, been published, um, that the canopoi tibia may not be contemporary, uh, contemporaneous with the craniodental material from that site that's attributed to anamensis. In which case, one alternative is that you know, maybe Anamensis is the taxon uh, or the lineage, repre represents the lineage that's also the Bertelli foot. But these are hypotheticals at this point, and, and, and they raise questions, which is great, but at the moment we can't get very far into it because it may never be known for certain whether the Canopoi tibia is contemporary with Anamensis or not. Could, could I ask a, a, a parallel question? Given the existence of the Bertelli foot, what specimens do you feel most entirely comfortable, aside from the, the type specimen uh, from Lytole, assigning to Australopithecus afarensis, given that we have reason for suspecting there are two lineages in there? I'm sorry, say, say one more time? Yeah. What specimens do you feel entirely comfortable do represent the same animal as the type specimen of, of uh, Australopithecus afarensis. You're talking about the hot R sample now. Are you asking me whether I think the hot R sample is potentially divisible into two based on the presence of the Bertelli foot? Yeah. Oh. Um, well, I wasn't. I was, sure I was asking it in a less embarrassing form. I was asking what what specimens do you think is are entirely what what specimens do you feel confident pointing to and saying that's Australopithecus afarensis? Um, anything with uh, cranial and dental material, because that's how the taxon has been okay. diagnosed. And that's how all the Australopithecus taxa have been diagnosed. None of them, to my recollection, have been diagnosed. Maybe Sadiba is different, but, but uh, no, I can't remember the diagnosis off the top of my head, but, but most, if not all, have been diagnosed exclusively on cranial dental material. So if I look at the cranial dental material from Hadar, I don't see evidence of, of diversity there. Mm -hmm. Variation, yes, but not, not diversity. If we get uh, craniodental material associated with a foot or other postcrania that suggests that there's a lineage in the middle Pliocene subsequent to Artipithecus that was spending time in the trees, then that, of course, then becomes an open question again. And this is, you know, referring back to the late 1970s and early 80s, there's always been an opinion vocal minority opinion that, that the hot R material is, quote, too variable to be accommodated in, into, a single, into a single taxon. Um, I've never been happy with that argument. I, th I think it fails on statistical grounds but if, and, and, and other morphological grounds as well. However, I will say that if it turns out that um, the hot R assemblage does contain more than one, it will be very difficult to disentangle them because in most respects, if they are sisters, they're going to resemble each other in far more ways than they differ. And, and um, 
and, and it'll be a challenge. Uh, all I can say is that so far, none of the post-crania that's come out of Hadar, in my opinion, is redolent of a foot like uh, uh, the Bertelli foot. Yeah, I agree. Other questions? Yes, Ed. So, well, that's weird. Um, in regards to Artipithecus, I was just curious. Um, I don't know how big she is, but wouldn't her, well, its size play a role in how much time it could be spending above the branches? That's a very good question. Uh, 50 kilograms is a pretty big arboreal animal. And, and, that, and, I, and I think that the reconstructed body mass uh, is potentially correct. Uh, I think one could make an argument that it might be a few kilos less, uh, but it's still going to weigh in at over 40 kilos, I think, no matter what kind of regression or which bones you pick. And you know, very clever people like John Napier long ago pointed out that you, know, you get a big animal on a, a fairly small substrate, the stable position of that animal is not on top of the branch, it's underneath it. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think that it's certainly possible uh, for a fairly large-bodied hominoid to be very arboreal, and we have plenty of examples. Orangs are a good example with extreme specializations. And, you know, chimpanzees uh, are very arboreal, and that, you know, there are different populations that vary in their commitment to, to arboreality. So, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it precludes uh, uh, being a, a highly arboreal animal. Uh, and if you go to, to Western lowland gorillas, you know, with, with males that are huge, you know, 165 kilos that are capable of climbing with great facility, you know, occasionally suspending themselves, uh, you know, I, I don't think a 50 kilogram hominoid is out of the ballpark for a largely arboreal animal. Alex? Yep. Really convinced that um, human ancestors do, or were not uh, didn't engage in suspensory locomotion, mm -hmm. um, and you also we also talked about why uh, not why but um, sorry about that R D did not engage in that and that the Tim White's team believed that um, the the ancestor to humans did not do that. The common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but what what would lead him to say that given the Ardy's bones, and what would be his motivations to saying that our common ancestor with chimps did not have that, given that we talked about in class, Professor De Silva, that usually anthropologists and anyone actually has motivations in saying and, and having certain claims. So what would be their motivations for that? Well, it, it turns out that I had the same experience that Professor Jungers did, uh, except not with uh, Tim White, but with on Lovejoy. That is, I went and said, uh, wait a minute, you said that Ardy was an above branch quadruped, and he said, no, we never said that at all. I don't believe that. Uh, okay, fair enough. I misunderstood you, and it's true. I can't find anything in the paper that exactly says that. But there's a, there's a, you know, one gets that false impression easily. But it's a false impression. Fair enough. But if Artie wasn't an above branch quadruped, then it was presumably doing a lot of suspensory kinds of posturing and locomotion. It was, you know, as you would expect a hundred pound animal to do. It's, it would have been spending a lot of time distributing its weight with the, the upper limbs under, under tension and, and the lower limbs maybe under compression. Um, uh, so the question is, given that Artie looks like that and that all the living apes do things like that, why do you conclude that the ancestor of, the last common ancestor of Artie and all the living apes didn't do that? And the answer has to do with such things as the intermembral index, which resembles proconsul, and it does, fair enough, I believe it, I'm, I'm a convert. Um, it has to do also with certain details of the anatomy of the wrist that Professor Lovejoy interprets as being indispensable to suspensory kinds of locomotion and that he does not see in Artipithecus. Um, and um, I'm just not enough of an expert to speak to that. Perhaps uh, Bill Jungers has something to say about it. Do you, do you see a, a good reason for, for seeing in the Artie 
skeleton reasons for saying that the common ancestor of Artie and the living apes was an above branch quadruped? I don't, again, I, I think that it depends if you pluck almost any earlier Miocene ape out of the fossil record, uh, you're going to be hard pressed to find a suspensory adapted animal with the possible exception of, of Oreopithecus. So if that's your, your hypothetical ancestor, then that doesn't appear to be the primitive condition. But um, I agree with you there. I, I sort of I, I use a term maybe as a default. If it's if it's not pronograde, then what is it? And you know, it's anti pronograde, which is a wonderful term that encompasses all kinds of arboreal behaviors, including climbing and suspension, uh, you know, anything pretty much except up on top of a branch in a quadrupedal posture. And and I think that Artie was capable of, if you if you want to put it in a quadrupedal. Position, I, I see it as more of a quadrumanous clamberer, where it's re, you know using mm -hmm. gripping hands and feet to pull it along substrates. But I don't think there's any evidence that it was walking like this on top of branches with the hands flat as a true pomegranate monkey uh, would have done. So, Some, something yeah, something that has to be said here generally is is the is the bar scene in Star Wars issue. That is to say, there's there's general agreement among people who who are very knowledgeable about the, the postcranial remains of Miocene apes, that once you get past the, the sort of bottom stratum represented by, by things like uh, Proconsul Hesseloni, uh, that you're getting mixtures of features that, that are not precisely replicated in any living primate. And so it's not clear what these things were doing. And when we start applying categorical locomotor terms like brachiator or above branch quadruped to these animals, we're almost certainly doing injustice to the complexity of their, of their locomotion. I just think that there is a lot of tension in the upper extremity going on in these animals, which is not the case in typical quadrupedal monkeys. That would, that would be the, 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 the most, ex, most radical position I would care to articulate in public. And, and I gather that there's a general agreement on that. And I think, I think that Professor Lovejoy would say that about Artipithecus. I'm just puzzled by the fact that he does not want to say it about the common ancestor of Artipithecus and, and other hominoids. Other questions? <clears throat> Christy? I'm relaying this question from afar. Not afar, but afar. <laughs> <laughs> from the afar. Ah, syllables, they make such a difference. This is actually from <coughs> Kaylee Orr. Um, is a generalized Miocene ape like Proconsul really a good outgroup to hominins? Couldn't supposedly shared characteristics of hominins and some Miocene apes be homoplastic rather than symplesiomorphic? Again, it depends on what part of the body I think you look at. Again, I think in terms of you know femoral anatomy, uh, it uh, is the, the Miocene ape-like pro proconsul is uh, remarkably more similar to a hominine than it is to uh, a great ape. Um, but re rephrase the, the question again: Is that would you restate it? Yeah, that, I mean, is it possible? I, I guess it's possible. Uh, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure how, how, how one would answer that. Uh, I, again, similarity seems to be the strongest case I can make for certain parts of the Miocene apes making reasonable ancestral morphotypes for, for later hominins, and better ancestral morphotypes, if you will, than any of the living great apes. I, mean, I think sure. this is perhaps part of a larger question, which is if there has been evidence that extant African apes are homoplastic. So if we accept that, that chimps and gorillas are homoplastic, then why don't we accept that any shared similarities between Miocene apes and hominins are also homoplastic? I think that's what he's getting at. I mean, the homopla there's no limit on the amount of homoplasia you can invoke. There is no practical limit, anything is possibly homoplastic. But if we start at the position in trying to reconstruct the shape of the tree of life that anything goes with regard to homoplasia, we might as well stop. 
because we can't get anywhere. Homoplasia is a wonderful thing for functional anatomy because it gives you general cases so you don't have to rely on unique ones if you can find them. But it's not a starting point for phylogeny reconstruction. It's not a tool for phylogeny reconstruction. It's an outcome of phylogeny reconstruction. And that's, we, if we don't adopt that as an operational principle, we can't reconstruct phylogeny. Hennig called it his auxiliary principle that similarity, derived similarity is, is assumed to be homologous unless you can show the opposite. And David Wake was quoted much more recently than Hennig as writing that one doesn't search for homoplasy. Homoplasy finds the researcher. So homoplasy, yes. But if we let it in the front door of analysis at the outset, we can just sneak out the back door and go and do something else. I'll become a functional morphologist. Well, maybe I won't. But uh, <laughs> no, 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 stop, please. <laughs> uh, could, could I uh, put in a, a slightly more skeptical position than that? Uh, I think there are problems with the identity. I agree that homoplasy emerges at the end of the phylogenetic analysis. But I, I also think homology emerges at the end of the phylogenetic analysis. Yeah, which but is not synapomorphy. Which is another one. No, I think, okay. Um, no, I think synapomorphy emerges at the end of the phylogenetic analysis. And I think that, that, I mean, basically what you're doing when you do a phylogenetic analysis is you get a list of all the, let's just take the simplest case, three taxa, human beings, chimpanzees, donkeys. Uh, let me pick a better example. Um, <laughs> uh, human beings, chimpanzees, goats. Okay? And you make, you make a list of all the resemblances. All right? And... Um, then you try to decide which resemblances are synapomorphies. Those are the ones that count for phylogeny. And, you know, one synapomorphy is sufficient to establish what the sister groups are. So you, your problem is, is determining which of these clusters represents the true phylogenetic signal. And the usual way to do it is something like counting. Okay? Uh, there are signals of, of all three possible kinds. We could say that human beings are more closely related to goats because there are beards in the males in both species. Okay. Uh, we could say that chimpanzees and goats are more closely related because they are covered with fur and human beings are not. Uh, or we can say that human beings and chimpanzees are more closely related. And it turns out that if you look at all of the similarities that human beings and chimpanzees have in common with each other, they all turn out to be plausible, most of them turn out to be plausibly interpreted as either synapomorphies of humans and chimpanzees or as simplesiomorphies, primitive retentions, like having five digits on each hand instead of two that have been lost in the goat. Okay, but this is basically a process of, of weighing the three piles and seeing which is the biggest. And there are other ways of doing it, like Bayesian probability that I don't really understand, but, but they amount to the same kind of thing. You're making an estimate as to which of the three possible assumptions is the least improbable. And, uh, and, and obviously, you know, treating characters uh, uh, as uncorrelated is a problem for functional morphologists. Absolutely. You know, many of those characters that you put on the list you know, is that is that a giant character complex that counts as a heavily weighted one character? Absolutely. Or is that, do and, we count them all independently? Those are and there are two kinds of philosophies. That, there are two kinds of correlation that have to be taken into account here. One is is uh, uh, functional correlation. Okay, in, in in general, you are not going, for example, to find. Um, um, redirection of the occipital condyles without movement of the foramen magnum in a, in a corresponding direction. Uh, uh, because things won't work if you try to change one of those and not the other. Uh, then there are genetically correlated things, things uh, where a, a single uh, genetic complex affects developmental changes in a whole bunch of pieces of morphology because of, of the way that, that uh, ontogeny proceeds. Uh, Professor Lovejoy thinks that a, a great many things about human evolution can be explained in those terms, whereas functional morphologists tend to think, no, uh, these are all separate pieces that are independently subject to natural selection. So there's, there's a good deal of debate about how things ought to be weighed, how, many, how you count things up as independent 
items to be to be counted in the balance and so on. But uh, so so there are a lot of difficulties about doing this. Absolutely. And, oh yeah. Uh, but do I, you know, is it possible to do it? Yes, uh, as I was saying to uh, our distinguished visitors before, uh, during the interim, there's no question that we know a lot about phylogeny. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a, here's a three taxon tree. Uh, human beings, donkeys, broccoli. Okay, I have no doubts about that. It's just true, period. Okay, but human beings, Artipithecus, Australopithecus animensis, we don't have enough knowledge to be sure. Yeah, and I, 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 I agree with, with everything you say. And my friend and colleague, Bernard Wood, who's very concerned about homoplasy these days, you know, he, he expresses it, as he did just a week ago to me, um, that, that homoplasy is, 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 a, is a concern because it, it prevents you from having too much confidence in your hypotheses. Right, so you need to be prepared to it to, to jettison them, and that's that's fair enough. And from my point of view, thank goodness I've not had any hypotheses refuted yet. So <laughs> I'm still waiting. <laughs> Other questions? Um, with more discoveries, obviously more light will be shed on like um, Artie's actual location on our phylogenetic tree, in your opinions, what is like the best anatomical trait that they could find that would give the most definitive um, answer about whether she was ancestral of humans or a completely extinct side branch? Like what discovery would shed the most light on that? Ooh, Christmas wish list for Artie. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, there, there was a one little component of that I didn't quite get, which was near the end, which... Um, what would you wish for, I think, if, in a new discovery yeah, for if, an Artie? to help resolve some of these issues. What could you find in the fossil record that would shed the most light on the issue that we're discussing today? What would elucidate the most as far as anatomy found in the fossil record? I'd like to see a vertebral column. Yeah. Verte a vertebral column yeah. would be really nice. Uh, the femur of Artipithecus would also be nice. Yeah. Uh, scapula. Scapula, vertebral column, sac sacrum. Calcaneus. Calcaneus, the back of the, uh, the, back of the cranium. A six million year old have. gorilla. Oh. Yeah. The six million year old gorilla in the room. <laughs> I mean, so th there's plenty that's still unknown about Artipithecus, as there is about Australopithecus, the cervical vertebral column, for example. So there, there are all kinds of gaps remaining to be filled. Um, but it, I mean, the list obviously depends on which particular question you're, you're interested in. Yeah. Uh, if you're interested in whether it's a hominin or not, there's a certain list of things you'd want. If you're interested in reconstructing the last common ancestor, that's a different list. Maybe. You know, we, we keep going around saying, if only we had some more fossils. And every time somebody finds some more fossils, it's another damned species, okay? <laughs> And, 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 and that not every time, but frequently enough, the Bertelli foot, the Sediba material, who knows what we're going to be getting out of the rising star cave in South Africa. Um, and, and every time you add a new species, you, you add an appallingly large number of possible cladograms to the uh, alternative cladograms to the, to the system. Um, what we need is, is fewer species. Um, that would you can start sending stuff back, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it also depends on the kind of question you, you want to address. Uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with already being in the hominin club, but I would be hard pressed to make a case for it being the ancestor of any specific species. Those situations are so rare, and, and I guess by good luck and good looks, you were able to find that for, for anamensis and afarensis, but that's such a rare phenomenon in the fossil record. It is, it's and, extremely rare. Well, in it's, the it's rare in terrestrial mammals. Yes, indeed. Okay, it's not rare in, say, marine invertebrates. No, no, in the invertebrate, that's correct. Yeah. I, I hesitate to say that because otherwise some, some creationist out there is going to stand up and say, see, there are no missing links, just as we said. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Caitlin. Um, I think this was addressed earlier a little bit as to um, why would Artie be bipedal kind of like in her daily life, what would she be doing? And I know 
Uh, someone said it would be kind of moving from patch to patch, from tree patch to tree patch. But from my understanding, she evolved in a more forest environment. So I don't know if I don't know if that's wrong or not. But I thought it was she was more in the forest. So why would she then like struggle with being half a climber and half a biped? Because if you're not really good at either, wouldn't you just be like well, eaten? You know, chimpanzees have fa faced the same problem and just solved it in a different way. I mean, you know, they're great arboreals. They're also very good in terrestrial locomotion. And even if you're an arboreal animal and build nests and forage, uh, you may exhaust the resources in that tree and you have to come down in order to ascend another one, even if you're in a forest environment. So, I, don't think you need, I don't think you need grasslands in order to invoke uh, the value and benefit of being a biped. There's also a minority opinion about the environment. But part of that difference of opinion also depends on different definitions of what a savanna is. Yes. And, and I want to say, first of all, that nobody has suggested, to my knowledge, that Artipithecus evolved in or lived in a tropical forest like you find Would gorillas and chimpan chimpanzees in, not including some of the so-called savanna chimps. They lived in a woodland, and it may have been more closed than open, but woodlands differ from forests in the degree of canopy continuity. So woodlands, you can move from, even closed woodlands, you can need to, if you're an omnivore, you move from patch to patch. Um, in, in ways that, you know, gorillas don't when they, in, you know, in the tropical forest. So, so the, the, de the definition of the habitat or the environment in which Artipithecus resided needs to be very carefully characterized because it's easy to get the wrong impression. Mm. I, I have another question for you guys. And, and in fact, I, I hope I can get some feedback from the front row there with professors not and Langergraber as well. Uh, in publishing these papers, one of the arguments made was that chimpanzees no longer make a really good model for understanding early human evolution. Um, and I, I suppose the first question is, is do you agree? Um, and, and if not, or even if so, what, what role or what value do studies of chimpanzees have for understanding um, human evolution? Uh, and, and saying it to folks who study the fossil record, and then saying it to folks who study living chimpanzees and, and living orangutans as well. Um, so what do you think? Well, I, 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 just because chimps are our sister taxon does not grant them a special place in our explanations of how humans became unique. Um, obviously, there has been evolution that we, we don't know about in chimps, but obviously there's been six to eight million years of evolution along the chimpanzee lineage, just as there has been in humans. Mm -hmm. But I don't give chimps a pride of place from an, an anatomical and behavioral point of view in trying to understand how humans became humans. Absent, including gorillas, orangs, gibbons, monkeys, and many other primates, and many other non-primate mammals. I resist the temptation to engage in using terminal taxa as living ancestors. Um, and, and, and I think we are led down you know, garden paths that way. Um, we have to be very eclectic in the data we utilize to understand how humans became human. And that means moving, casting a broad net on the tree. It's put there, it's nice to have other facultative bipeds, which chimpanzees are and really understand how their musculoskeletal system either facilitates or limits the kind of motions they can make. I would assume that, you know, you know, chimpanzee dental morphology and isotopes, you know, would also be informative perhaps about. But, but if chimps had teeth like gorillas, I don't think, you know, we would be any more inclined to, to use those teeth or any less inclined to use those teeth, you know. Well, maybe not for. Yeah, maybe not for phylogeny. No, that's what I'm saying. That's what we're talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah. I think. Just, just for purposes of reference on the environmental issue, um, uh, the the quote is that uh, Artipithecus ramus preferred the more wooded um, uh, habitats along the available spectrum in the regional geography. That is, ranging from closed canopy forests to 
uh, open grasslands, and that uh, this is a distinction between Ardipithecus and Australopithecus, and that, uh, quote, the integration of available physical and biological evidence establishes Ardipithecus ramidus as a denizen of the closed habitats along this continuum. Yeah, but closed habitats doesn't imply tropical mm -hmm. forest, mm -hmm. completely closed canopy. They were closed. It is to the closed. I don't think they're in 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 the East Africa in Eastern Africa during the Pliocene. I do not believe there were habitats that look like the habitats that that uh, living apes are in today. What about galleries? There were gal there were no doubt galleries, but if unless they were confined to the galleries, seems unlikely to me. They were on the ground moving around uh, from patch to patch. Yes. All right, so now that I've been disabused of my misunderstanding about uh, whether or not Artie is a, has ever been claimed to be a quadruped, um, you said a couple of times, you know, pick your homoplasy. So if we reconstruct, how much homoplasy are we picking if we reconstruct the LCA as a quadruped versus if we, if we reconstruct the LCA as a suspensory animal? I'll, good, I'll, I'll need good, an, an envelope to. Good question. How to weight, how to weight a character, you know, integration, all that sort of thing. But you know, you just ballpark your gut feeling. How much homoplasy are we part picking? Of, part of the yet? problem. Part of the problem here is weighting the traits. Okay, and nobody does this when they do formal phylogenetic reconstruction and crank the trait list through the. Uh, through the algorithm, but everybody does it when they think about it. And for example, um, I think Professor Kimball would say that he regards it as much more likely that um, uh, knuckle walking adaptations have been independently evolved in chimpanzees and gorillas than that the loss of the canine P3 honing mechanism has been independently evolved in Ardipithecus and, and Australopithecus. Uh, so you're making a, a judgment as to what the you make in, in, in arguing these things. You make judgments as to what you think the likelihood is of things evolving in parallel. Um, I didn't mean to put words into your mouth, Bill. Maybe you wouldn't make that judgment, but I was just suspecting that you would. Well, no. I mean, I wouldn't make the judgment by comparing the one character to the one character. But with regard to Artipithecus, at least it's more than one. Synapomorphy. Uh, it's the canines. It's the cranial base, and depending on how you view the cranial base, possibly a third character is the bi is the terrestrial bipedality. So they are independent, unless the cranial base is speaking to the bipedality. They are independent corroboration of one another. Right. That's the strength. Is that you have two, perhaps three, independent systems that are giving you the same phylogenetic signal. That's where the strength comes from. Now you can turn it around and say, well, we've got knuckle walking, and then we've got the, you know, the unusual superorbital torus of the African apes, which you don't find anywhere else among the catarines. And you know, all other things being equal, they're great synapomorphies, but they're not. I mean, they are synapomorphies, but they're not homologous, right? They're not homologous. So, so you know, you could and it ultimately becomes how big is the pile, right? Because I, I I, don't, I can't see of an objective way to say that in the skull it's more likely, homoplasy is more likely than in the postcranial skeleton. And, and there have been arguments both ways, but the most convincing ones that I've seen says that even characteristics within the masticatory apparatus and other functionally sensitive areas of the body, which since Darwin have been held up as the least faithful, as likely, least likely to be faithful to phylogeny, turns out that that's not necessarily true. So. Uh, yeah, I don't think one system is more likely no. to be homoplastic. I think there's been some work on that. Didn't Blythe Williams, wait, didn't she do a study of, of other mammal groups where so the homoplasy was just as likely to occur yeah. in the craniodental region as in the postcranium? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Wood and his co workers, of course, have come to very different conclusions. So you take your pick, basically. basically. Are there other questions? Ed in the back. So if 
Australopithecus afarensis is after Ardipithecus, and afarensis is much more bipedal than Ardipithecus. Do you think Ardipithecus sheds any light on what the driving forces for bipedalism would be, since they, it ha would have a lot of negative pressures, since you can't outrun anything, really? So why would bipedalism be selected for? Seems like a good question to end on. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, well, I, I think maybe the the type of habitats that they that afarensis is in, uh, probably the frequency of bipedal behaviors. You know, I certainly would uh, agree that afarensis is a much more terrestrially adapted hominin than than Ardipithecus. I don't think uh, you know what's you know. I think there is, you know, I used to think that there was evidence of hind limb elongation uh, uh, that was modest in Australopithecus. Now it already makes me less secure about that because we, because you know, I want, I know certainly by the time we get to Homo, you have a reconfiguration of the body plan with long hind limbs and, and that's related to the economy of, of locomotion. Uh, but, you know, I think there really are features, like we talked about the, the big toe and already being sticking out like a, a, a big sore thumb, you know, that's gone by the time you get to afarensis. I'd, I'd be fascinated to know if it's gone in anamensis. You know, for me, uh, if the Christmas wish list of fossils, I'd love to see more already, uh, but right now I would love to see a postcranial skeleton of anamensis to help us understand if it makes a reasonable link uh, functionally and phylogenetically mm -hmm. uh, between afarensis and already. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I actually agree that, that it's, pro it's undoubtedly related to the increasing prevalence of, uh, of open habitats. And, we, and if that is in fact the case, then actually we may see a, a, a functional link uh, between the increasing incidence of bipedality and dietary change. Uh, because the early Australopiths show a dramatic differentiation of the masticatory apparatus by comparison to Ardipithecus, no matter how you do it. I mean, if you look at the, the skull of Ardipithecus, except for the cranial base, the rest of it in the face and the dentition and so forth looks nothing like Australopithecus, and except in so far that they shared a more general set of similarities. Great, so Bill. I think, very I think well we have to wrap up. Uh, we're getting to our end of time here. Um, so uh, if you have more questions, certainly come see us in the reception area afterwards. Um, I want to thank Kay Brown for the idea for having this in the first place, for bringing these folks here and for organizing all of this. Thank you so much. Um, and nice job with the questions, you guys. You did BU proud. Very nice job. Uh, so thank you all very much. Thank you, Drs. Kimball and, and Jungers. And thank you, Mark, Matt Cartwell. Uh, thank you very much.